time. Make some noise for Jesus. One more time, Revolution Church. All right, all right. We're starting a brand new series today called Free, and we're talking about being set free. Last week, we talked about how God has given us as Christians authority to cast out demons and evil spirits. He's given us the authority to do that. We see this throughout all the New Testament, and in fact, it was completely normal to do this in Jesus' day. It's just the church has become completely silent on this issue. And the reason why is because we're fearful of what this means. We're not sure what this means. And I gotta tell you, as a church, we have a lot of work to do because we're not gonna remain silent any longer. The devil has done a great job convincing Christians and scaring Christians concerning demons and evil spirits. So much so that the church has stopped using the weapons that we have to fight against our enemy. We've just become paralyzed in fear. Think about this. If he can't get you, if, if he can get you to doubt a demon's existence or tell you that a demon can't do anything to you because now you're a Christian, what you'll do is you'll stop fighting because you don't believe that they're real or that they don't have any power to do anything to you. But I'm here to submit to you today that that couldn't be further from the truth. We have to learn to armor up. I know lots of people, including pastors, that are demonized. They're demonized. The devil comes to oppress, to hurt, to harm. Let's review a passage of scripture we shared last week uh, concerning this idea of Jesus with his disciples and casting out demons. It says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority. Everybody say that with me. He gave them power and authority. So he gave to his followers power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Then in the next verse it says, not only to drive out the demons and cure diseases, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, to spread the message of Jesus Christ everywhere they went and to heal the sick. There are four things that he mentioned here in this scripture that, that he has given his followers authority to do. First one is drive out demons. Second one is cure diseases. Third one is to proclaim the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel. And the fourth one is to heal the sick. The next verse he says to him, he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. In other words, free, freely you've received. You received freedom whenever you came and, and wanted freedom from me. I gave you freedom from all your sins. I cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And now I'm giving you power and authority to go and trample on snakes and scorpions and defeat the enemy in my name. I'm giving you that. Now, if you weren't here last Sunday, I encourage you to go back online to RevChurchTX.com and watch week one of this series because some would go, oh, that was the 12 disciples. That was the original 12. We talked about how they weren't super disciples, right? That They weren't like the Avengers. You had Jesus, the main Iron Man character and the supporting cast of other Avenger characters. It wasn't like that. He, he gave them the power and authority to the 12, but then he also sent out, the Bible says, the 72, 
with the same power and authority. And then he told the 72, hey, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers into the harvest. In other words, he's not content with 12. He wasn't content with 72. 72 plus 12 is 84. He said 84 is not enough. Let's pray for more of these people to come in to the Lord, the, the Lord of the harvest may send them out to go do the same things I'm telling you to do. We talked about how the Bible says in Matthew 28, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to observe all the things I have commanded you. Well, these, this is all the things that he's commanded us. Why is this not, right? So this is kind of the introduction of last week and kind of moving in. I got to get some uh, framework built if we're going to move forward. The, the first thought that I want to talk about is the idea of possession or oppression. Possession or, or oppression. As a quick review, if you're not a Christian, the Bible teaches that a demon can fully possess a person's body because you don't have any relationship to God. So there is no Holy Spirit inside of you because you don't know him. So possession is for people who choose to say, I don't know Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't know God. And maybe even don't even want to know God, right? That would be a person that could be possessed. If you have no Holy Spirit, you're susceptible to an evil spirit, a demon. The word oppression is different than possession. Possessed means I possess the whole thing. Oppressed means I'm coming here and I believe that Christians, if you're a Christian today, I believe that you can be harassed, demonized, and oppressed by an evil spirit absolutely is possible. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that, Pastor. I think that once you, once you pray and ask Jesus to come into your life, then he's there and you got the Holy Spirit and you're protected and you're good. Let's read some scripture, all right? Let's just, let's just go back to the Bible. 1 Peter 5 says this. It says, be alert. Be alert. In other words, pay attention. Keep your eyes up, right? ears up, right? Be alert and of a sober mind because you have an enemy. Now, time out. Pause real quick. Who is he talking to here? Is he talking to non-Christians or is he talking to Christians? Christians. And we know that because there's an enemy out to get us. The enemy isn't out to attack himself. The enemy's out to attack Christians, believers. So this says, be alert and of a sober mind because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion and he's actually looking for someone to devour. This is what his whole goal is. So as a believer of Jesus Christ, I know I have the Holy Spirit because when I prayed, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes in and he's with me. But he tells me that I need to armor up. Now, why do I need to armor up and put any armor on at all if I don't have to worry about any demons doing anything to me or the devil attacking me in some way? No need for armor because God's just gonna fight everything for me and do everything for me if I hold that theology. I don't hold that theology though because I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that we as Christians have to be alert and of a sober mind because our enemy is looking to devour us. Let me talk a little differently. I believe the number one goal that the devil has is to keep you and I from ever becoming a Christian. That's goal number one if I'm the enemy. How do I keep you from trusting Jesus, believing he died for you on a cross, believing that he really came back to life, believing he's God? This was the whole purpose of why Jesus came. Remember, he left heaven because he wanted a relationship with you and I. He said, I'll pay the price for sin. My blood will make you forgiven in Jesus' name. And, and you're going to be starting this new life with me at, at the helm as your leader, right? That's why Jesus came. So the number one goal of the enemy is to keep you from becoming a believer. But if he can't do that, if he can't keep you from becoming Christian, the second thing he's going to try to do is make sure that you do not by any way jump in serving anywhere, helping other people meet, know, and follow Jesus. Because if they start a relationship with him, that's not good for his team. This is a team God versus team devil scenario. If you do become a Christian, his second best thing is to keep you from serving and spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Is this making sense a little bit? Okay, good. Let's keep going. John 10 says this. The thief, so we know it's not God, the thief, the enemy, the bad guy, he comes only to steal and kill and destroy. This is the devil's whole purpose, is to steal, kill, and destroy from you and I. So he's out on mission right now. The Bible says, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
Now, this is so important. Jesus comes to give us life. And we're not just talking about any life. We're talking about true life, abundant life, overflowing life. And the devil, on the other hand, comes to take away from you, to steal from you, to destroy you. So clearly, we're in a battle with the devil. Guess what? Even if you don't want to be. Well, I don't even want to fight. I'm a peace person. That's great. The devil don't care. He's out to fight you. He don't care what you think. Our lack of willingness to address the demons and fight in the battle does not make the demons give up or stop attacking, tormenting, and harassing us. Therefore, we have to learn how to fight back. This is why the scripture then tells us in Ephesians, based on what you know, therefore, based on knowing this information, put on the full armor of God. You need armor because there's an enemy that's going to attack you and try to do something to you. So that way, when the day of evil comes, and somebody kind of asks, they say, Pastor, when's the day of evil? Well, let me tell you when the day of evil is. It's called Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And now that you know when the day of evil is, we can put on the full armor of God. So that way when the day of evil comes, because he ain't, listen, he ain't like waiting to come. Let's think about what we actually believe because we get warped up in our minds. He's not thinking about when to come. He's coming and he's coming now. He's here. He says, when the day of evil comes, you got the armor of God, you may be able to stand your ground against him. Standing ground means I'm not letting you take any territory against me. Standing ground means I'm standing firm. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, I like this. He says, don't just stand, stand firm. There's two different ways to stand. If I'm sitting here talking to my buddy Joe and we're just having this good conversation and I'm just kind of sitting here hanging, somebody could walk up behind me and just go boop and put, you know, I'm fall straight to my back, right? Because I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I'm not standing firm. A different way to stand is to go, hey, I'm going to put that back leg out like that to give me some firmness here. I'm not just gonna stand, I'm gonna stand firm. It means I'm ready. You wanna come hit me, come, come push. I'm not gonna go down. Why? Because I'm ready. Be alert, be of a sober mind, be paying attention because your enemy, the devil, is looking for someone to, de to devour. We have to learn how to fight back and we fight back with the power and the authority given to us to, from the Holy Spirit. We stand firm with the Holy Spirit. So to be clear, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit is when we begin to fight back. It's through the power of God that we take out the enemy. If you're doing it on your own power, you ain't gonna get to do it. It's not your power that can do it. It's the power that's in you through the Holy Spirit that can take out the enemy. How do we do it? We start by renouncing and rejecting those evil spirits and telling God we don't want any part of them. Then we bind those spirits up and we cast them out and we ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit. This is how we fight back against the enemy. This is the process that you have to learn how to do as a Christian. So let us start this series off today by addressing just one demon. Here's, here's what I want to do in this series called Free. I want to get us freedom, but I'm going to do it one demon at a time, right? There's a lot I want to teach you, and I can't go through everything all at once. So I'm going to go today with the demon of fear, the demon of worry, the demon of anxiety. Fear, worry, and anxiety. And I believe they're running rampant all over the church. I believe they're tormenting, and I believe that we don't have to put up with them and deal with them, but we do. Why do we? We shouldn't. Let's do something about it. After I teach you through this, I'm going to invite you to have that demon of fear cast out of you and give you an opportunity to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say filled with the Holy Spirit, there's confusion, so let me address that real quick. When I say filled with the Holy Spirit, that might mean to some people, well, okay, you think I don't have God and I need the Holy Spirit. No, if you've prayed and asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just, cleanse you of your sin. Cleanse you from all that unrighteousness. He's there. The Bible says he seals us with the Spirit until the day of redemption, right? We have the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It means the Spirit's in there. There's parts of Scripture that says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't punch him, punch him down so far where he's not operating. Let me say it in terms we understand. When you're at the restaurant and, and you got your, your, your cup of coffee and it's about three quarters of the way gone, you got about a quarter of it in there. And the waiter comes up and says, hey, you want me to top that off for you? You go, uh-huh. And he goes, shh. Didn't mean you didn't have anything in there. 
Holy Spirit's in there, but to be filled with the Spirit is to request God to just take, hey, permeate throughout my whole body. This whole vessel is yours. I don't want any demonic presence near me, around me, or tormenting me. These things that have a grip, these strongholds, I want them released in Jesus' name, and you fill up those places in Jesus' name. That's what we're talking about today. So, anxiety, fear, and worry. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says this. Paul is writing, and he says, I remind you, I want to remind you of something, Christian. I remind you to stir up, stir up in your coffee mug, stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir up the gift of God. What's the gift of God which is in us? Boom, the Holy Spirit. I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And many people, they receive the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. We see that throughout the Bible. As we keep going, he says, for God has not given us a, say it with me, he has not given us a spirit of fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. He gave us power and of love and of a sound mind. This is what he gives us. So real quick, let's not read too quick or go too fast. If God didn't send fear into our minds, then who did? The devil. And it comes in the form of a demonic presence, a demon of fear. I want you to see how the Bible, some stories today of the disciples, the followers of Jesus that were battling the demon of fear. All right, I'll show you in Mark chapter four today in verse 35, it says, that day when, when evening came, Jesus, he said to his disciples, he says, hey, let us go over to the other side. So Jesus has just had this big revival meeting. People are giving their lives to him. Their lives are being transformed. He's healing people, sicknesses, casting out demons. He's doing the whole thing, right? He's got the whole thing going on. Evening came, he says to his disciples, hey, here's where we're at, but let's go over here. I read that this week and I thought, man, that's how I feel like the church is today. That's exactly what I, what I want to say to the church. Church, here's where we're at. Here's the stuff that we believe. Here's the lies that we believe. Here's the torment that we go through, demonic oppression that's battling against us. Here's how the enemy's taking ground. Here's what we need to do. We need to stop being stuck in our old lifestyle and our own way of thinking. And we need to come to the other side because on the other side, there's something that God has for us over here that he wants us to see. And if you're willing to listen to Jesus, you can actually get to the other side. Let's look at the next verse. He gives us a little context. He says, leaving the crowd behind, because again, there's a lot of them. They took Jesus along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. So some context is, they're all going over. There are a bunch of them going over. Not all of them, but there are a bunch of them going over there in all these little boats to the other side. Next verse says, a furious squall came up. Now, I don't know what a squall is, but it doesn't sound good, all right? Especially a furious one. Like, it wasn't a regular one. It was a furious one. So, a fur when I read the Bible, by the way, like, it, it makes sound effects to me. So, it's like, a furious squall, squall, squall. A furious squall. I don't know. Maybe that's too happy. A furious squall came up. Furious squall came up. And the waves, the Bible says, the waves begin to break over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Translation, a storm came and water began to pour into this boat. And this is like the worst case scenario if you're a fisherman. If you're out there on the sea, how many of y'all go out on the lake, you go on the sea, you get in your boat? Come on, don't be scared. You, but, what is this halfway stuff? Okay, like, we, are you a boat lake people or are you not boat lake people? Like, like who, who likes to go out on the sea on the lake and do all that stuff? All right, good, 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 good. I see y'all. See, be happy about it. Do you know you can, be, you can be boat and lake people and be a Christian at the same time? It's okay. Like, you get to do both. Totally okay. So, so you know, though, when you're out there in the water and all you can see is water around you, you know the worst case scenario is water getting into the boat. Okay, that's what's going on here with the disciples. And I started thinking, let's, let's talk about that for a second. What's got you down today? Why are you fearful? Is it money? Maybe it's a rough marriage. Maybe it's a child that won't listen. Or maybe it's a family member with health issues. And it's got you terrified. Maybe you're fearful of the stock market and your retirement. And you're going, what is going on? Maybe it's every time you enter a room with lots of people, you, you start to have a panic attack. It's like, what's the storm that has you scared? 
And maybe, you, maybe you're scared, honestly, maybe your fear is that you're gonna be alone. A lot of people deal with loneliness, you're scared of being alone. I know a lot of people are scared of dying. That's, that's a death demon, a demon of death. We'll actually talk about that in a future, future Sunday. I, I think it's gonna be really important, especially if you're having suicidal thoughts and you make sure you're here. It's gonna be very important for you. Maybe you're scared of the future. Worried about what can happen, worried about medical bills. Maybe you're worried about your job security. You know, they've been laying off people at the work and you kind of think, man, I think I'm on the line next and I'm, I'm concerned. Maybe you're, maybe you're fearful, how are we gonna get out of this debt? We all have things that plague us and make us fearful. However, for some people though, when I say spirit of fear or a demon of insecurity or worry, it's not just the, the mind understanding, oh yeah, fear. It's kind of like, I have a pit in my stomach. Something happens in your body. It's like, ugh. Or I, I'm getting sweaty and I don't even know why. I, I shouldn't be this scared, but I'm just, I'm, for some people they shake. They, I, I, I just, mm. for others, their throat feels like it's got a tennis ball in it. And it's like, starts to swell up. When fear comes, for some people, they can't think clearly. Either their mind is just totally racing out of control and they can't ever just capture any thought. It's like, ah. Or, 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 or their mind's not racing. They go, I can't think clearly. And they just totally freeze. And they can't make any decision. No decision can be made. They just freeze. You and I have both seen situations like this, either in other people that we know and love or even in ourselves. You say things like, I, 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 don't, my, I don't know what to say. I'm panicking. Some people say, I'm panicking. I just, and they get mad and they get louder and their volume raises. I'm, I, others go, I can't catch my breath. I know a lot of people like that. There's others of you that you worry and you're so fearful that when you wake up in the morning, Honestly, your thought process is just going through all the ways of how everything's gonna go wrong and how bad things are gonna get and how bad things are gonna be. See, I mentioned fear and you go, oh yeah, I know fear. See, but when I mention fear that way, you go, oh yeah, I know fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. God didn't give you that. That's not from him. God doesn't want you tormented with that for the rest of your life, dealing with that. Come on, church, God loves us. We are his sons and his daughters. He cares for you. He died on a cross for you. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us power and love. And guess what? He gave us a sound mind, not a mind that's blank and doesn't know how to make a decision, not a mind that's racing and can't come up with a thought. God's given us something. So you know, if you don't have power, love, and a sound mind, you've probably got a demon of fear attacking you. Because God says, listen, notice he didn't write, for God has given us fear. He wanted us to know that it's a spirit of fear. Well, isn't this just normal? Isn't this just life? Isn't this just what it is? No, 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 no. See, when the Bible talks about familiar spirits, it's just been with you so long that it's, you just think it's part of the family and it's familiar to you. It's not supposed to be there. Let's continue to read. These disciples, they're terrified. They got water coming into the boat. They're fearful. Verse 38, what's Jesus doing? Let's listen, where's Jesus at? Jesus was in the stern. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> He's sleeping on a cushion. Now I read that the first time when I read it, I got mad. I'm like, come on God, like here we are out here dying in the middle of the, the water where the boat's about, to, where, God, are you kidding me? I got mad. And God kind of stopped me and said, hey, read, read that again. So I was like, okay, well, you didn't change it. I'm still going to be mad. Let me read it. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was in the stern and he was sleeping on a cushion. He goes, now, why do you think I was sleeping on the cushion? Because he wasn't worried. He wasn't afraid. He knew he had power and authority over even the darkest storms. So then I read it a third time and I was like, okay, God, what are you really saying? And then it made me really happy when I read it. It's funny, I went from anger to happiness because what if it read Jesus was in the stern and then he realized everything bad that was happening and he started freaking out and he started saying, oh man, hurry, I didn't know this was gonna happen. Get all this stuff off the boat, we're gonna die. Ah. If it would have said that, I would have been really freaked out. 
So then I got happy that, you know what, Jesus, he ain't mad at all. He's like, let me just get some beauty rest over here on this cushion. Why? Because he knew. I got authority over all that. I'm not worried about that. I can handle, hey, I can handle that storm. The disciples woke him up though and they said to him, teacher, don't you even care if we drown? Let's be, let's, hey, let's be honest in church. Anyone ever wondered, God, do you even really care about me? Come on, put your hand up. Don't be scared. <laughs> Some of you are too, too fearful to put your hand up. Right, okay, I got you. It's a natural question in our flesh to go, God, do you even see me over here? Do you even know what's going on? <laughs> Teacher, don't you care if we're drowned? He got up. Jesus, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, he said, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and the Bible says it was completely calm. That right there is the power of God. He can just use his words and speak to a storm and it will have to obey and be quiet. There it is. So, so, so pastor, I got a storm going on. What do I need to do? We just have to ask him to, to help us do something about it. We just have to go to him. See, 99% of the time that we solve all the problems on our own power and authority and all the things, we've tried everything we know how to do. Oh, I guess there's nothing else I can do but pray. I guess the only thing you should have been doing was praying. <laughs> Verse 40. He says to his disciples, he says, why are you so afraid? Now, isn't that kind of funny? It's like, hey, dude, are you paying attention to the weather report out there? What do you mean, why are we so scared, right? Because that's what we do. We get, we get all freaked out about everything going on in our life and bogged down. We go, oh, why are you so afraid? And then he says this to him. He says, do you still have no faith? What he's really saying is, do you still not know who I am? How many, hey church, how many times are you going to come on Sundays and still not know who God is? Do you still not know who he is? God is wanting to know if we have faith in him or are we still afraid? And so many Christians, get this, we trust God for our salvation. We trust him for heaven. We believe he died and came back to life, but we don't trust him with our trials and our hardships that we face. And we're more scared of those demons than we should be. And we're honestly, we're even scared of Jesus. We're scared of the whole thing. There's a fear of the whole way around. And God said, I want you to armor up. I'm giving you power and authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Nothing shall come against you and harm you in his name, in Jesus' name. We got to armor up. Well, God, he, he, came to, uh, he came to give me heaven. He, he can give me heaven, but he can't do anything about my marriage. And he can't do anything about my financial picture. And it's always been this way. Or he can't change my future, or give me a job, or help me parent my kids, or get me through anything, really. He's really just here for heaven, and that's it. That's a lie. But so many Christians just show up to church. And listen to the pastor and watch the worship team and leave. And go, God, is this all there is? And he's up there going, nope. It's not all there is. Hmm, verse 41. <laughs> they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? The winds and the waves obey him. And let me just tell you, church, and so do the demons too. They have to submit a Jesus name. You know, the Bible says that the demons know who Jesus is and, and they tremble. They tremble at the name of Jesus. Some of y'all, you, you think you're impressed me. You go, oh, pastor. Say, what? What's going on? Pastor, oh yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I say, okay, so what? Even the demons believe in God. I'm not impressed that you know God. You're on the same level as a demon. I'll be a little more impressed when you decide to level up and become the person that God's called you to be and spiritually mature in Christ. I, then you could impress me. But here's the deal. It's not about impressing me. I'm just letting you know. The demons, don't be on the same level as a demon, bro. Come on. It's time to, it's time to go further. I want to share you another story. And I, I kept it in the theme of the, the bad weather stories, okay? So the today's story um, is about one of the top three disciples named Peter. Peter, a time whenever he was out there in the water. It says right here in Matthew 14, it says, The boat was now in the middle of the sea, so it was kind of way out there. 
Again, the bad weather, wherever they're at, don't live there. Tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary to the boat. The wind's contrary. Got a bad storm going on here. The Bible says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. Walking on the sea. Just an ordinary day for Jesus. Just crazy old Jesus out there. He's like, let me get my jet skis on. Oh yeah, I'm wearing them. Okay, I'm good. And what? He didn't need jet skis because his feet just walk on the water. He just go out on the water. Just an ordinary day for Jesus to go out there into the boat. No big deal. And the Bible says in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, these are the followers, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost. When they saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were troubled and they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out for, say it with me, they cried out for fear. Now I'm not gonna lie to you, I'd probably be freaking out too if I saw somebody walking on the water like that. Like what in the world is that? But they saw Jesus and they think Jesus is a ghost. Translation, they think Jesus is the problem out there. Oh, there's a ghost coming. What is that? Can you imagine? What is that? What's he going to do? How many of us have been guilty of thinking that Jesus is the problem? <sighs> Jesus isn't the problem. He's the solution to the problem. 99% of the time, though, something bad happens. Who do we point the blame at? God. Why is it God? Think about the enemy. The enemy comes and he's coming to attack us, steal, kill, and destroy. And the first person that we blame when we get attacked by an enemy is God, our own teammate. How does this make any sense? It doesn't. It says here, they cried out in fear and thought they saw a ghost. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, he says, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. If you do a study about fear in the Bible, I challenge you to do it. Look up the word fear in the Bible. See how many times it appears. Look up, do not be afraid in the Bible. It appears 366 times in the Bible. That's one for every single day of the year, including leap year, okay? He didn't forget any of them. Do not be afraid. Do not be fearful. You don't have to live in fear. Next verse says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, so he's like, I see you out there, God, but if it is you, it's like there's this little doubt about who God is and what he's about. If it is you, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. In other words, he says, I want to walk on water too. If it's really you, let me walk on water. This is where Peter became really faith-filled. And he's like, if God is here, then a miracle can happen. Church, I submit this same thing to you. If you want a miracle today, you're going to have to believe that God is here and he can do it for you. Okay, I submit that to you. Bible says in the next verse, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is huge right here. The Bible says that as a result of Peter's faith in Jesus, Peter got to experience the miracle of walking on the water. Peter experienced the miracle because he was faith-filled. Don't miss your opportunity today, church. It's going to require you having some faith. It's going to require you going, I'm on this side, but Jesus is saying, hey, let's go to the other side right here. reason I wanted to start off this series dealing with the demon of fear it's because I can teach you about all these other demons and about how you need to be set free of them. I'll teach you about the, the spirit of pride, the demon of anger, the demon of lust and envy and jealousy and laziness and death and greed and gluttony and spirit of heaviness and depression and doubt and poverty and a spirit of sickness and infirmity. I could teach you about all that. I can teach you about getting free from these things, but if you're too scared to get out of your seat, to be honest, to come forward to get prayer from somebody who can cast out a demon off of you, we can't go very far. So we deal with the spirit of fear first. Peter walked on the water because he was faith-filled. He trusted Jesus. But watch what happens in verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. When he saw the wind, he became afraid. When he saw the wind, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, Peter cried out saying, Lord, save me. 
Bible trivia time, ready? What did Peter see that was boisterous? The wind. The wind. How many of y'all seen the wind before? Have you seen the wind or have you seen the effects of the wind? See, the effects of wind, we don't see wind. Peter saw something that wasn't even there. Let me make it hit home. Many things we worry about never come to pass. They never even happen. But we've spent three, four, five, six, six days, a week, two weeks, three weeks worrying about this event that's going to happen. Oh, it's going to be bad. No, oh, it's going to be bad. And it never even happens. You've worried for it for, a, for, for way too long. God didn't want you to worry about it at all. It was never going to happen anyways, but you worried the entire time. I'm going to say a line here, and I think it's really from God. So listen to what I'm saying here. It's hard to see the wind when we're looking for Jesus. It's also hard to see Jesus when we're looking for the wind. Verse 31 says this, and immediately Jesus, he stretched out his hand and he caught Peter and he said to them, he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Today, when you pray for your deliverance from a spirit of fear, let's do so without doubting that God is gonna set us free. Let's remove doubt in Jesus' name. It says in verse 32, and when they got into the boat, guess what? The wind ceased. Where Jesus is, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's a freedom that comes. In order to experience your miracle, it requires you, listen, in order to experience your miracle, it requires you to get out of your comfort zone. If you're not willing to get out of your comfort zone, you're not gonna experience a miracle. So you'll, you'll leave here the exact same way that you came. Those that get out of the boat, that get out of their comfort zone, they experience the miracle. Now the miracle is available to every single person. He doesn't look at you and judge you based on how much money you have, what skin color you have, how experienced you are in the church, or if you're brand new or you've been here a long time. He doesn't do any of that. The miracle is available to everyone, but in order to experience the miracle, it requires you get out of your comfort zone. I think a lot of people are going to get it today. I'll say it this way. In order to experience the miracle, you have to just get out of the boat. Peter could have never walked on water if he didn't get out of the boat. Got to get out of the boat. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Working through it right now, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I believe there's a lot of people in here, and I've seen hundreds of people. I've probably seen four or 500 people already today come and get freedom from a spirit of worry, anxiety, and fear. And I believe I'm about to see a couple hundred more, okay? Here's, here's how the process works. Let me walk you through how it's gonna go, okay? Many times in the scriptures, in the Bible, when we see people being set free of something, getting their freedom, getting a healing of whatever it is, or getting a demon off of them, Jesus many times would say, do you believe? He'd ask them, do you believe? He's really saying, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that I am God? And if you believe that I am God, he would many times send them away and say, your faith has made you whole. It requires faith and belief in Jesus in order to have that, that demon off of you, to have it removed. So the first thing that I always encourage people when I'm on the prayer line and they come up and they say, hey, I'm battling whatever it may be. It could be anything, whatever they're battling. I always start with, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then here we are trying to rebuke something out of you. Well, you don't have Jesus in you. You need Jesus. So what I'm going to do in just a second is I'm going to put up our, our salvation prayer. I'm going to lead everybody in this room. If you want freedom today from a spirit of fear and anxiety, let's start with that relationship with Jesus. So there's two pray prayers that I'm going to pray today. The first one is a salvation prayer. After I pray that salvation prayer, and I know everybody's been given the opportunity to choose Team Jesus, then I'm going to lead you through a second prayer where this prayer you're going to reject and renounce a spirit of fear, anxiety, and worry. You reject it and renounce it. You don't want it any longer. Bible says that, that, that basically there are opportunities where the devil, he's going to, like a thief in the night, come, try to, try to creep in in any door that he can get in. And if you got the door cracked just a little bit, he's coming through. They call that, in the spiritual world, they call that an open door. If you have a door open, the enemy can come in. Imagine if you left your house today and you left the door open just a little bit. So I'll come back in five hours. 
Okay, well, that's the choice you made. But when you do that, anything can come through that door during that period of time that you're letting that thing be open. If I knew a bad guy was approaching my door, I wouldn't keep the door cracked. I'd shut the door and I'd lock it and I'd keep him out. When you have that open door, the enemy tries to operate. So what we're going to do, whether you've opened that door and you know, hey, I opened that door when I went and did this. For some, let me give you some examples. If you say, because um, it's third service, I got a little extra time. Check this out. Third service, right? You open yourself up to horror movies or going to a haunted house or reading demonic books or you've been dabbling in the occult at some point in your life, something like that. You open yourself up to Ouija boards, things that are obviously not of God and are direct opposing to God. When you do those type of things, you've opened the door for the enemy to come in. So don't be surprised when you wake up one day and you go, what in the world's going on? Well, what's going on is somebody has come in that you've allowed in. You open the door for them. We have to close the open doors. You have to close the open doors. That would be one. Uh, maybe maybe you don't know where it came from or, or how it got in. Whether it came in and you're aware or whether it came in and you're unaware of how it came in, it really doesn't matter. If somebody's in my house that's not supposed to be in my house, let's just get them out of my house, right? Let's just, let's just hey, and let me tell you, demons, they want to squat in your house. They're the best squatters there are in the world. They just let, they'll stay there as long as you'll let them have a little guest room in your heart. That's what the Bible says. Don't give them a guest room in your heart. Because guess what? When they stay in the guest room, they also have to use the bathroom and they have to go in the living room and get food. And they're, they're all, they're guest room. Don't give them a guest room because they permeate the whole place. Let's start with the relationship with Jesus. Then we're going to renounce and reject the spirit of fear. After we've done those two steps, I'll give you the next things that are going to happen. If you know you need a relationship with Jesus, let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. If you prayed that prayer just now and you chose a relationship with Jesus, we're going to put a number on the screen. I want you to pull out your phone and I want you to text the, the, the word new me, new me with no spaces, new me with no spaces to the number on the screen, 55498. I'm going to send you a reply back once I get that text message that basically tells you more about that prayer you prayed and gives you some next steps to following Jesus. Step one of getting free from a spirit of fear, anxiety, and worry is you have to have a relationship with Jesus. Let's move into step two. If you're dealing with the demon of fear, let's address it right now by praying this prayer. Say, God, I do not want a spirit of fear near me, in me, or following me. I desire to be set free. I desire your Holy Spirit to give me peace. I reject and renounce a spirit of fear. Please set me free of all worry, anxiety, and fear in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now that we've renounced and rejected a spirit of fear, here's the process. I need our prayer partners to come forward at this time. Worship team, if you'll get into place. Here's what's going to happen. These guys are beginning to worship and proclaim the name of Jesus in this room. If you've renounced and rejected that spirit of fear and you didn't want it, and you've asked the Holy Spirit to be part of your life, you have a relationship with God, the first thing I want our prayer partners to do, so prayer partners, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be instructed a little bit. I want you to get your anointing oil out. I'm going to explain to everybody what the anointing oil is so they don't have to do it individually to everybody, okay? The anointing oil in the Old Testament, whenever they'd pour the oil onto somebody, it was representative of the presence of God in that person's life. If you became a follower of Jesus, the first thing I want you to do, prayer partners, I want you to ask them, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? They're going to say either yes or no. If they say yes, then you ask them the second question. Did you pray to renounce and reject the spirit of fear? They're going to say yes or no. If they say no to the question of I don't know Jesus, then lead them to Jesus, right? Give them that salvation prayer. Um, if they say no to the rejection of, of spirit of fear and anxiety and worry, lead them through that prayer, okay? After you've done that, again, they're going to anoint you with the presence of the Holy Spirit once they know you're a Christian. 
Then what they're going to do is they're going to look at you in the eyes and they're going to speak not to you but to that demon. And they're going to tell that demon something like this. It'll be along these lines. You guys have the freedom that the Lord gives you uh, to administer this in your way, but here's how I'm going to do it whenever I get down here. I'm going to look at the person in the eye and I'm going to say, by the authority of Jesus Christ that he's given me as a follower of his, I command you, spirit of fear, to stand at attention right now. You are trespassing against a son or a daughter of the Most High God. I bind you up in Jesus' name and I tell you you're not allowed to speak, you're not allowed to move, you're not allowed to talk to them any longer or do anything. You have no control and no power over them. You heard from their lips that they renounce and reject you right now, that they do not want you, that they want only the Holy Spirit of God. So I remind you, demon of fear, I remind you of the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to remind them of the cross, y'all. I'm going to remind them of the cross where Jesus gave his life for them. Then I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus over that person. I'm going to say, I plead the blood of Jesus over my brother Kevin. Spirit of fear, anxiety, worry, you're trespassing and you have no right to be here. So in Jesus' name, get up and get out. Go. Now, prayer partners, when we say go, we need to command them where they're going to go, okay? I would suggest that we command them to go to Jesus Christ of Nazareth for their sentencing. So go to Jesus Christ of Nazareth for your sentencing. Don't say go to Jesus. There's a lot of Jesus in the world. Okay? They're going to go and find some guy named Jesus somewhere and go torment him. So let's not send him somewhere to some guy named Jesus. It's not going to be good. Okay? He's going, what happened to me today? Well, a lot of bad. Okay. Let's send them to Jesus Christ for their sentencing. They know where they're going. And God, by the way, they know they can't stay. So right now, even as I speak about them, here's what I'm doing. I'm shining a flashlight on you right now. And if you have a demon of fear on you, I'm exposing it. And let me tell you, two things happen when we expose demons. They either get really angry and they go, don't listen to all that. Don't do any of that. They, and they tell you in your mind, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Because they know they're about to be expelled out of you. Who likes losing their home? Anybody want to get foreclosed on today and lose your house? Neither does that demon. And we're going to foreclose on it and we're going to expel them and cast them out. They're going to lose their home right now in Jesus' name. Not allowed to stay. So what I want you to do is I want you to stand to your feet. Our worship team is going to be singing a song here in just a minute. After you receive your deliverance and they cast that out, I want you to start saying right, right there in that moment, I want you to say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fill me with your spirit. I want you to request the Holy Spirit as soon as you get that demon out of you. And then I want you to go to your seat and I want you to worship like you've never worshiped before. I saw some people in the services before. Uh, basically what they said was the lady said, I've never worshiped like that before. She said, I never lay, like raising my hands in church. I never understood it. And she said, I think I was fearful of it. And as soon as she got fear off of me, I went, boop. And I go, yeah, that's how that works. And so... Let God do what he wants to do, but worship is a weapon. Use your weapon today as we worship. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat. There's no, we're not going row by row. Just come up and find a prayer partner. You go, that's my dude right there. One, two, three. Let's move. Let's move.
the voices. somewhere in that range of demons that we were just getting out of the person and they were like a totally different person as soon as they got through all that totally different person I wish I had the ability to deal with every single thing all in one setting but I, I feel like I want to teach our church at the same time so I think I absolutely know I have the authority to do that and if I sat in a session with you we could unpack your whole life and do it and it would take some time so the problem is there's a thousand of you and there's like one of me right now right and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you each week the authority and the power that God has given to you and how you can walk in the freedom that Christ offers for you. And I believe that once you receive it, freely you receive, freely you give. You're going to be up on the prayer line praying over people because you know, well here's why, because you know what it's like to live in torment and you also know what it's like to be set free. And when you're set free, it's so much better than living in torment. That's why we're prayer partners. That's why we're up here. That's why we do this, because we want you to have that freedom too. I'm so proud of so many of you. Lots. Of, listen, church, let's celebrate this. Lots of people gave their life to Jesus today. Lots of people. Amazing. Lots of people are set free of that spirit of fear. Don't open the door for it to come back. We'll deal with more later. We're going to say goodbye to our online campus. On the count of three, help me out. One, two, three. Goodbye.